Go with me, if you would, to the 17th chapter of the book of Acts this morning. And I want to spend a little time with the greater context of a verse I quoted for you on Friday night. A verse I quoted on Friday night that honestly I didn't have in my outline, I didn't really think about, it just came out, I remember saying it, and it's been on my mind ever since I said it on Friday. I went to bed last night, had a few thoughts written down for this morning, some things I wanted to say to you just as friends, and some of the things I opened with right here to encourage you. And Before I slipped off to sleep, I said, Lord, I'd like that thing, I'd like that verse that sort of burns in my spirit that I wake up with. I've done this frequently through my life in ministry. A lot of times I'll go to bed with a thought, but I won't have exactly where I want to go with it or what I want to base it with, and I'll talk to the Lord before I, my final sleep and say, Lord, if, if this thought is you, wake me up with the text that is needed for this thought. And I can't tell you the times over the years that I've woke up thinking of nothing but that Scripture. Sometimes I didn't even know where it was in the Bible. Didn't know the chapter or the verse or the book. Had to go Google it or look it up and say, where is that? I think that's there. And then... So many worlds would open as the Holy Spirit would take us down that journey. And I think that has to do with as you file the Word of God away, the Holy Spirit knows how to bring back what you're looking for and what you need. Well, I woke up with that phrase in the 28th verse, In Him we live and move and have our being. That was on my heart so powerfully this morning that in Him we live and move and have our being it's not only poetic we'll find out why it's poetic as we read the story it's not only poetic but Paul believed it to be so true and I want to read into that if I could for a moment contextually so go back with me to the 22nd verse and let's watch Paul addressing the Areopagus he is in Athens speaking to a bunch of heathen what we would call heathen idol worshiping Athenians Greeks who spend their day in the Areopagus arguing over theology and doctrine and knowledge. They like to volley back and forth these answers of tough questions. So Paul stands in the midst of them in verse 22 and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you're very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. Now watch Paul's gospel when he's speaking to a group of people who know nothing more than to build idols and put a a plate on it that says to the unknown God. Paul grabs that unknown God and uses it in his message. He says, let me speak to you for a moment about the God you don't know, but you're inadvertently worshiping. Here's what that God looks like. God, 24, who made the world and everything in it. Since He's the Lord of heaven and earth, He does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is He worshipped with men's hands as though He needed anything, since He gives to all life, breath, and all things. And He is made from one blood. The word blood there was not in the earliest Greek manuscripts. Paul most likely says, and He has made from one every nation. Paul's reference, I think, is all the way to Adam. God has made out of one man every single nation to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for Him and find Him though He is not far from each one of us. For in Him we live and move and have our being as also some of your own poets have said for we are also His offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and by man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because He's appointed a day on which He will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom He has ordained. And He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And Paul closes the thought with the same resurrected Jesus he opened with back in the 16th, 17th, 18th verses when he shows up in Athens and no one understands resurrection and everyone mocks him for resurrection. So Paul takes a different tact. And he turns to the statue of gods that they don't know, that they're worshiping ignorantly. And he says, that God, though you don't know what his name is, 
That God fashioned you and founded you and created you. That God made you to exist out of the blood of one man. And he has done everything to place you in this moment at this day so that you will do, verse 27, I love this front half of this verse, this first phrase, so that they should seek the Lord. Notice Paul's statement. God put man here so that man would seek the Lord. I don't believe that you were placed on the earth to praise. All right, and that's a very common thing to say. We like to say that in worship sometimes. Go, hey, we are all created to praise God. I don't think that's why you were created. God had plenty of angels that created Him without you coming along. I think you were created for a loftier goal than just to be a praiser. You were, you were created to seek God so that in seeking God you would find relationship and you could live the life of God on the earth. And so it was loftier than just you were created so you could sing a song or clap your hands or come to church and worship. But you were created so that you should seek the Lord. There's meaning on being on the earth and it's meaning that propels us forward. It's really like this. I think meaning gives definition to the things that matter in your life. Whatever matters in your life becomes your meaning in life. Let me tell you some things that matter to Paul White. Now you're going to understand this because they're going to be very familiar to you, though they're going to be different specifics. What matter to me are these two ladies on the front row. Now, they matter very, very much. And the young man in Nebraska, they matter very much to me. In fact, they matter to the point that they consume my thoughts and they consume my heart. And they give me meaning on the earth. Because I have a reason to be the man I want to be because I have these ladies and I have that young man. And if I have nothing else in the world, I have enough meaning to put my feet on the floor and move forward because I have a glint in my eye and something to take care of. So when things matter to you, they become meaningful to you. And when they become meaningful to you, you live for them and you die for them.